द हाउस ऑफ हॉर जर्नल रेजिनल क्रिस्टी गॉट हिज किग्स बाय मार्डरिंग वुमन एंड सेक्शुअली एब्यूसिंग देयर कॉर्पसेस ही वेंट ऑन अबाउट हिज ग्रिस्टली बिजनेस इन हिज शबी हाउस इन नॉटिंग हिल गेट लंडन हुज एड्रेस टेन रिलिंगटन प्लेस हैज सिंस बिन इन फेमस क्रिस्टी वॉज बॉर्न ऑन एट ऑफ एप्रिल एटीन नाइनटी एट इन हेलीफैक्स योकशायर हिज फादर आर्नस्ट अ डिजाइनर फॉर क्रॉसली कार्पेट्स वॉज अ पिलर ऑफ लोकल सोसाइटी बींग अ लीडर ऑफ द प्रीम रोज लीग एन ऑर्गेनाइजेशन इंटेंडेड टू प्रोमोट मॉरलिटी एमंग द वर्किंग क्लासेस एंड ए फाउंडर मेम्बर ऑफ द हेलीफैक्स कंजर्वेटिव पार्टी He was also a stern disciplinarian and his son was terrified of him. We almost had to ask if we could speak to him, he later wrote. Christie also had other problems within his family. One of seven children, he was completely dominated by his older sisters. Christie did well at school and sang in the choir. He was first a boy scout and then assistant scout master. But there were other deeper tides flowing within Christie when he was 8 for example his grandfather died and Christie reported having felt a trembling sensation of both fascination and pleasure on seeing the body after leaving school Christie started work at the gym cinema in Halifax one day he was part of a gang of boys and girls who went down to the monkey run as the lookers lovers lane was known they paired off and Christy found himself with a girl who was much more sexually experienced than he was intimidated he could not rise to the occasion and when word of it got around his friends started taunting him calling him reggie no dick and can't do it reggie at the age 17 christy was caught stealing at work and sacked whereupon his father kicked him out of the house he had to sleep on the family's allotment and his mother to him food he then drifted from job to job until he was called up to serve as a soldier during world war 1 he was gassed in france before being sent home and discharged from army with a disability pension on 20th may 1920 christy married the long suffering ethel waddington he got a job as a postman but was caught stealing money from letters in 1921 He was jailed for 9 months. 2 years later, he was bound over for posing as a former officer. Following a violent incident, he was put on probation and when he was sent down for another 9 months for theft, Ethel left him. In 1929, he was sentenced to 6 months hard labor for assaulting a prostitute. A Roman Catholic priest befriended him, but Christie stole his car. which earned him another spell in prison on his release christy wrote to ethel asking her to come back to him and she foolishly did so they moved to london and on a visit to ethel's family in leeds christy boasted of his big house in london and his servants in fact he and ethel lived in a shabby little flat in north kensington with no servants he never earned over 8 pounds a week which was the going rate for a junior clerk On the outbreak of World War II in 1939, Christie became a special constable in the War Reserve Police. No checks were carried out to see if he had a criminal past, but in any case, he seemed to be a reformed character. He was never much liked, however, because of his petty mindedness, indeed, Christie and other special constables were known as the Rat and the Weasel. Although he was balding, Christy still regarded himself as a charmer. Deep down, however, he feared and hated women. Women who give you the come on wouldn't look nearly so saucy if they were helpless and dead, he thought. He took pride in hiding his violent intentions from the woman who he took back to the 10 Rollington place, and by the time that they arrived there, it was too late for them to save themselves. His first victim was an Australian refugee, the 17-year-old Ruth Forrest. Ruth worked in a munition factory, and because the pay was poor, she supplemented her income with the proceeds of a little prostitution. Christie had met her when he was trying to trace a man 
who was wanted for theft. She had asked him to lend her 10 shillings and Christie had invited her home. On one hot August afternoon in 1943, while Ethel was in Sheffield, she called again at 10 Rollington Place. At first, Christie refused to engage in sexual intercourse, but Ruth encouraged him. Once the sex was over, he strangled her. Christie said that he had felt a great sense of peace after he had killed Ruth. He had been fascinated by the beauty of her corpse and had wanted to keep it. But his wife had returned home unexpectedly that night and he had had to bury Ruth's body in the garden. He compared his debut in Murder to an artist's first painting. It was thrilling because I had embarked on the career I had chosen for myself, the career of murder. But it was only the beginning, he later said. Christie left the police force at the end of 1943 and went to the work at Ultra Radio Works in West London, where he met an attractive 31-year-old woman. Christie left the police force at the end of 1943 and went to work at the Ultra Radio Works in West London, where he met an attractive 31-year-old woman, Mural Yadi. Mural suffered from cataract and Christie claimed that he had a remedy for it. On one afternoon in October 1944, she therefore went to see him at 10 Rollington Place and he showed her what he claimed was his patient inhaler. In fact, it was nothing more than a jar contained perfumed water that had two holes in its lids with rubber tubes leading from them. Christie then persuaded Mural to inhale his remedy through one of them. Unbeknownst to her, the other tube was connected to the gas pipe. The perfume in the jar concealed the smell of the gas and when Mural lapsed into unconsciousness, Christie had sex with her and then strangled her. He was thrilled by his notion that his second murder was much cleverer than his first. In 1948, Timothy Evans, a lorry driver and his wife Beryl, moved into a top floor flat at 10 Rollington Place. Born in Matthewvale on 20th November 1984, Ethan's was educationally challenged and also had a speech impediment. Impediment When he was a child, he couldn't even pronounce his own name. His schooling had been held back further by a foot injury which caused him to spend long spells in hospital. Evans' father had walked out on his mother before Timothy was born. His mother subsequently procured a certificate saying he was presumed dead. She later remarried and the family moved to Notting Hill Gate where Timothy married a local girl Beryl Theorley in 1947. Evans was 24 when he saw the Toulette sign outside 10 Rollington Place. He and the pregnant Beryl were still living with his mother and stepfather and because the young couple desperately needed a place of their own, they took the cramped attic flat. Charles Kitchener, a railway worker with failing eyesight, lived on the floor below. He kept himself to himself and was often in hospital. The ground floor was occupied by John and Ethan Christie. Shortly after the events moved in, Beryl gave birth to a baby daughter, whom they named Geraldine. The Evans and Christines were soon getting on well and Ethel, who was fond of the baby, looked after Geraldine while Beryl was working part-time. In the summer of 1949, Beryl became pregnant again. There was little money coming in and the Evans were behind on their higher purchases payments. Beryl, who was still 19, wanted an abortion, but Timothy, a Roman Catholic, forbade it. The adamant Beryl then discovered that there was a backstreet abortionist on the Edgar Road who could help her by performing the abortion himself. She in turn told Timothy of Christie's offer, who said that he had not realized that Christie knew anything about medical procedure. In order to reassure him, Christie showed him the St. John's Ambulance Brigade's first aid manual. Evans, who was illiterate, knew no better. On 8th of November 1949, Evans comes home to find Christie waiting for him with bad news. The operation had not been a success, Christie explained, and Beryl had died. Christie begged Evans not to go to the police, saying that he would charge with manslaughter because Beryl had died during an illegal abortion. Evans' first concern was who would look after Geraldine and therefore suggested his mother, but Christie said he would find someone else to come in for the baby. When Evans returned from home, on 10th of November, 
Christie said that he had delivered the child to a couple in East Acton. And that evening, Evans assisted Christie in disposing of Beryl's body down the outside drain. Christie helped Evans to sell off his furniture and Evans then returned to Wales with £40 in his pocket. He was plagued by guilt. However, believing that as Catholic, he should have stopped Beryl from having the abortion. If he had done so, he reasoned, he would still have been alive. So he walked into Martha Wells police station and confessed. Evans thought that he could take the blame for Beryl's date without implicating Christie, whom he considered to be his friend. He therefore told the police that he had obtained a bottle that contained something that would make his wife miscarry from a man who he had met in the transport cafe. He had not intended to give it to his wife, he said, but explained that she must have found it while he was out at work. When he returned, he had found her dead and had opened a drain outside the front door into which he had dropped her body. The Martha Vale police contacted their counterparts at Notting Hill Gate, who sent police officers to 10 Rollington Place. It took three of them to leave the man who covered the drain, only to find that it was empty. Back in Martha Vale, the police then challenged Evans' statement. He could not possibly have lifted the manhole cover himself, they said. Unable to continue the pretense, Evans made a second statement, this time telling the truth. Christie, he said, had performed an illegal abortion on his wife, who had consequently died. Together, he and Christie had disposed of the body. The police had searched 10 Rollington Place, but not very thoroughly. They did not even notice Moral Eddie's thigh bone which was propped up against the garden fence. Christie made a statement saying that he had overheard the Evans quarrelling. Beryl had complained that her husband had grabbed her by the throat he liberated. The police believed Christie. After all, the man had been policeman. The house was searched again and this time, Beryl's corpse was found. It had been wrapped in a green tablecloth and hidden behind a stack of wood in a downstairs washroom. Beside it was the body of the 14-month-old Geraldine. Both had been strangled. An autopsy revealed that there was bruising in Beryl's vagina and that her right eyes and upper lips were swollen. In the police view, this evidence confirmed their belief that Beryl's murder had been a simple domestic. Evans' trial took place at the Old Bailey's in the January of 1950. Standing in the witness box, Christie apologized to the judge for speaking softly, explaining that this was the result of having been gassed during World War I. The court was also told of his service as a special constable. His long record of petty crime was not mentioned and the impression was given that he was a solid citizen whose word was not to be doubted. When he was asked if he had performed an illegal operation on Beryl Evans, he denied it saying that he had been lying ill in bed on the day of Beryl's death. Evans cut a much shabbier figure. He was out of his depth in the courtyard and gave his evidence poorly. His allegations that his wife had died during an illegal abortion performed by Christie held no water with the court as the evidence proved that she had been strangled. Furthermore, he could not explain the death of the baby. The jury deliberated for just 40 minutes before returning a verdict of guilty. The sentence imposed by the judge was death by hanging. Evans maintained to the end that Christie had killed his wife and daughter. There was sub-public disquiet about the verdict and a petition bearing nearly 2,000 signatures was presented to the Home Secretary appealing against the verdict. It did no good and Evans was hanged on 9th of March 1950. Christie later said that on 14th of December 1952, he had been woken when his wife Ethel went into convulsions. Went into convulsions. She seemed to have overdosed on phenobarbital and Christie decided that it was too late to get help. It would be kindest to put her out of her misery, he reasoned, and he put a stocking around his wife's neck and strangled her. Unsure of what to do with it, he then left his wife's body in the bed for two days before pulling up the floorboards in the front room and burying her under them. The couple had been married for 32 years. Over the next four months, Christie sold his furniture to fund 
a sex and murder spree. The 25-year-old prostitute Rita Nelson had just discovered that she was pregnant when on 12 January 1953, she visited 10 Rollington Place. When Christie strangled her, subsequently shoving her body into an alcove in the kitchen, the 26-year-old Kathleen Maloney was lured into his flat to pose nude while he photographed her. Instead, she was gassed and sexually abused, her body then also being placed in the alcove. Christie had more trouble with his final victim, Victoria McLennan. He had met her in the cafe in which he picked up prostitutes and offered her somewhere to stay. She had turned up at 10 Rollington Place with her boyfriend. However, after they had been there for three nights, Christie at last found her alone on 6th March 1953. He gave her a drink and offered her a whiff of his inhaler, which she did not enjoy. Following a struggle, Christie strangled her and had sex with her corpse. He then bundled her body into the alcove, joining those of Rita Nelson and Kathleen Maloney, propping her up into a sitting position with her bra hooked to Maloney's leg. After that, Christie built a false wall in front of the alcove and papered over it. He sublet the flat to a couple called Rayleigh, took his dog to the vet to be put to sleep, and moved out. The landlord subsequently evicted the Rayleighs and gave Bretsford Brown, who was living in the flat that had been previously occupied by the Evans, permission to use the kitchen in the ground floor flat, provided that he cleared it out. After Brown removed the cloths, rubbish and filth that Christie had left behind, he started to redecorate the kitchen. He had wanted to put up some brackets on the rear wall, but when he tapped it, he found out that it was hollow. Pulling away some of the wallpaper, he saw the papered over wooden door. On opening it, he discerned a partially clothed woman's body sitting on a pile of rubbish. Brown promptly called the police. The police soon discovered that there were more than one body at 10 Rollington Place. A thorough search of the alcove revealed a second wrapped in a blanket and then a third, whose ankles had been tied together with plastic flecks. All three had been strangled. Next, the corpse of Ethel Christie was found under the floorboards in the front room. The police quickly realized that John Reginald Christie was the man for whom they should be searching and issued his description to the press. His picture appeared in every national newspaper and appeals for information regarding his whereabouts were made over the loudspeaker system at football matches. Soon the whole country was looking for a slight, balding, middle-aged multiple murder. There were numerous reports citing of Christie, but few were genuine. Meanwhile, in the tiny garden of 10 Rollington Place, the police had unearthed the skeletons of two more women, which they estimated had lain buried for about 10 years. Both women had been strangled and the skull of one was missing. On the day that he left 10 Rollington Place, Christie had moved into a hotel in King's Cross Road. He had soon moved on, however, trampling back and forth London, homeless and alone. At around 11 p.m. on the night of 19th March 1953, at the height of the biggest manhunt that the country had ever known, Norman Ray, the chief crime reporter of the Sunday newspaper, The News of the World, received a phone call. Do you recognize my voice? The caller asked. Ray did. He had met Christie during the trial of Timothy Evans. I can't stand it anymore, said Christie. They're hunting me like a dog. In return for a meal, some cigarettes, and a warm place in which to sit, Christie promised that he would give the news of the world an exclusive. They arranged to meet at 11.30 outside Wood Green's town hall, and as Ray parked outside, a two policemen walked by. It was pure chance, but Christie ran off, thinking that he had been double-crossed. Two days later, PC Thomas Ledger stopped a man near Putney Bridge, who in response to the constable's questioning said that he was John Waddington of 35 Westbourne Grove. The young policeman then asked him to turn out his pockets, one of which proved to contain a newspaper cutting from 1950s concerning Timothy Evans' murder trial. The hunt for Christie was over. Christie made a detailed confession, providing a separate and self-serving explanation for each killing. The prostitutes has forced themselves upon him, he said. 
and things got out of hand. His wife had had to be put out of her misery. The murders of Merrill Eddy and Beryl Evans had been mercy killings too. At his trial, Christie pleaded insanity, but could not disguise the fact that he had carefully planned the killing, which he described with a chilling lack of contrition as those regrettably happening. He had even constructed a special apparatus with which to gas four of his victims. Christie was found guilty and sentenced to death. There was no appeal and he was hung on Pentonville at 9 a.m. on 15th of July 1953. There remains a legal problem, however, in that Timothy Evans had been convicted of the murder of his wife Beryl and their daughter Geraldine, murders to which Christie has subsequently confessed. A formal inquiry was therefore set up, which concluded that two murderers had been operating at 10 Rollington Place. Christie had told the truth at Evans' trial it reasoned, but had lied at his own. In 1966, a judicial review of the case under Mr. Justice Brabin concluded it was more probable that Evans murdered his own wife, but not his baby daughter. No one knows for sure who killed Beryl Evans. Her husband Timothy and Reginald Christie both took their terrible secrets to gallows with them. Only one of the two men only one of the two men knew the complete certainty whether or not the other one was lying. If you have enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe and leave a comment as it helps the YouTube algorithm grow the channel. You'd find similar contents in my other videos. Have a safe day. Signing off.